I often say that we become a better human as we become a better leader and vice versa. Today, we're talking with two wise leaders about some key things we can do to become a better leader. And yes, a better human being too. Welcome to another episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast, where we are helping leaders grow personally and professionally to lead more effectively and make a bigger difference for their teams, organizations, and the world. If you're listening to this podcast, you could be with us live for future episodes, like some people are right now. And uh, therefore, you could get this information sooner and, and interact with my guests. And so if you want to do that in the future, you can learn more by going to our Facebook or LinkedIn groups. Just go to remarkablepodcast.com slash Facebook or remarkablepodcast.com slash LinkedIn to do that. Our episode today is brought to you by our latest book, The Long Distance Team, Designing a Team for Everyone's Success. You can learn more, uh, figure out, find out where you can order a copy and get an excerpt by going to longdistanceteambook.com. That's longdistanceteambook.com. Dot com And now I'm going to bring in our guests and then I will introduce them and let's see if we can do that. Welcome to our two guests today. They are Doug Lenick and Chuck Wackendorfer. Did I get it right, Chuck? Perfect. Oh. Like you've been saying it your entire life. Well, listen, I'm, probably <laughs> say, I'm only going to say it once because I don't want to break the, I don't want to break the chain. Uh, let me introduce you to the two of them. And then we'll dive in. Doug is the founding CEO of Think to Perform, a high performance leadership development firm serving small and large organizations in a variety of industries. He has been in leadership roles for nearly 40 years and is widely recognized as an expert in the science of human behavior. Chuck Wackendorfer is the president of distribution at Think to Perform. He is a renowned leadership development professional, has worked with clients including American Express, Wells Fargo, Comerica Bank and TD Wealth of Canada, Charles Schwab, and others. His insights on leadership have been featured ex exclusive, extensively in media, including CNN Money, Forbes, Fortune, and the Denver Post. Together, they have written a new book titled Don't Wait for Someone Else to Fix It, Eight Essentials to Enhance Your Leadership Impact at Work, Home, and Anywhere Else That Needs You. Leaders, human beings. Welcome, guys. So glad that you're both here. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks for having us. So uh, we're just going to dive in here. And again, if you're with us live, you've got questions, ask those questions as we go. Uh, we're going to dive in here and just say, uh, Chuck, how did it come to be that you started working together? Sort of what got you to, to this place? You know, our, our history, Doug and I's history goes back probably longer than either one of us would want to admit. I think I met Doug and 1986, Doug was a legendary leader at that time at American Express. I was brand new to the company. I had, a, had an interest in learning and doing more in my new career as a financial advisor. And so I literally called Doug up one day. I happened to be in Minneapolis, which is where his office was based, or St. Paul maybe, I think, at the time. Asked if I could have some time on his calendar. He didn't know me from Adam. Uh, and he, he made time for me to chat. And so I drove to his office. We spent myself and another colleague spent about probably an hour or two with Doug kind of picking his brain on why he was doing so well and how he thought. And he was very generous with his time. And it just has always impacted my life and my career ever since. So I feel very grateful. He's actually on my Mount Rushmore of people who have influenced my life. Well, that's got to feel pretty. See, Doug's lifting his eyes. So, so Doug, I'm going to ask you a question. Of course, I did not know that story. Uh, so, Doug, um, I don't know. You you may not remember that meeting like Chuck does. That certainly would be possible. But I, I'm just going to ask you a question about um, then and now what you thought and how you think about the role of being a mentor. Uh, because clearly that's what Chuck was looking for in that moment. So, like, just just lean into that, Doug, and talk to us about what your thoughts are about the role of being a mentor? Well, you know, I'm kind of trapped in a, uh, a philosopher. I'm a philosopher in a business body. So, uh, so I, uh, my role, you know, and we think about that, that in, you know, you know, don't wait for someone else to fix it. My view of mentorship, and we talk about it in our book, and is really a, change the word to leadership. 
I, I've always believed that all of us are leaders and all of us are followers. All of us are influencers and all of us are influenced. And I actually do kind of remember that meeting uh, with Chuck uh, because it would happen. I happen to remember that group of people and they, they were rising stars and obviously Chuck's had a great career, but uh, I I view this as a responsibility that we have. It's it's a it's inherent in all of us that we are influencing others, and so we get a choice. What kind of influence do we want to be? We don't get to choose. Do I influence people? We will, we will influence people. We also will be influenced, and so I take that very seriously so the mentor thing is a two-way deal i learn as much from the mentee as the mentor or my mentors would say the same to me and so i learned from chuck chuck has learned from me and that's how it goes and what we talk about in don't wait for someone else to fix it is it's time that each of us accept the responsibility to do something rather than waiting for somebody else to do it yeah, so that kind of answers my next question, but Chuck, I'll let you add to that. It, you know, it's, it is a, you know, I get, I get books all the time, people, whether they show up or whether people pitch them to us. And, um, and so I've, and I've been reading business books for 35, 40 years. And so I'm kind of a, I'm kind of a uh, observer of them in many ways. And, and the title of this struck me immediately. Don't wait for someone else to fix it, which by the way, it sounded like my father could have written it. As it turns out. <laughs> but like, what? I mean, Chuck, say a little bit more about the title because it's not a typical the title of a business. I've been saying this book, for years. Right? She thinks we owe her royalties now. Uh, no, but it, it is. I think sometimes it, you know we all catch ourselves waiting. Like I wish some you know these other people would be different so my life could be better. And when, when Doug and I wrote the book, we didn't want to write a business leadership book. Doug has written several. I have, this is my first book. We wanted to write a book that would impact any anybody anywhere, regardless of their position, their title, what job they had, what industry they were in. And I like the way you set up the, the podcast today. If I'm a better leader, I'm a better human and vice versa. We definitely believe that. And to Doug's point, we're influencing people all the time. So it's about like, what kind of influence do I want to have? And where can I make a positive impact, particularly in my own life? And if I'm living a better life, I'm going to positively impact other people, either by my example or by my influence. You know, one of my favorite sayings is the school of experience has expensive tuition. <laughs> so I can either learn this on my own or as we were talking about earlier around mentoring, I can seek out other people to give me guidance and input and feedback because as, as we talk about in the book, we all suffer from biases. We all have psychological patterns that contribute to decision-making mistakes and decision-making has twice the impact on performance in any area of life, more than talent and skill combined. And I can't get any smarter. My IQ is fixed, but I can become a better decision maker. And we make about 35,000 decisions a day. Oh, and by the way, Chuck, earlier, Kevin said this. You you commented on what he said at the beginning. He referred to us. I wrote this down uh, so that, uh, Kevin, I, I, I quoted you on this. And it's, it's you called us two wise leaders. Two exactly. wise leaders. Put it, put oh. it in the, put it on the book, <laughs> put it on the website. Uh, two wise leaders. So, um, you know. Better two wise leaders than two wise guys. <laughs> I, I, I didn't know you yet when I wrote well. that. So I had to, you know, now let me, Marissa, I'm going to go back and re-record the opening. No, I'm just teasing. Uh, so, um, you know, when I, when I read, don't wait for someone else to fix it, the word that immediately comes to my mind is proactive. Right. And as a leader myself, I, I, I want, I don't want my teams to team members to wait to fix it. Just mm -hmm. someone fix it, be proactive. And, and we can certainly connect the word being proactive with being a leader, being out front, taking sure. charge, moving forward, et cetera, et cetera. So we're going to get in, to all of these things as we well, go. One of the things, and Doug, your comment about all of us being leaders, like that's the opening chapter of the book, right? That's where we start. 
Yeah, everyone's a leader. That's how we open it up. Everyone is. Everyone's a leader. Everyone's a follower. It's just the way it is. And once we accept that, then we get to make a choice. And that's why we say one of our essentials is you get to make a choice. And the first essential choice you should make is to aim to be your ideal self. It, you know, if, if and if you aim to be your ideal self, your ideal self is not waiting for anyone else to fix it. And when you guys were talking about, you know, re, you know that title and hearing our parents, I could hear my mother. I, I don't know if I can say this, but my mom, I, I, I will try it, but my mom would say to me, Doug, uh, it's time to go out and uh, clean out the dandelions. And I said, do we have to do that now? And she would say, Doug, do you have a turd in your pocket? Because there is no we here. This is you, Doug, going out there. And unless there's a turd in your pocket, there's no we. And she would say that to me. Don't wait for this is your assignment, not not we. And, and well, we're just, trying to do let's just take the dandelion thing for a second because you know when they first come up, now's the time we gotta pick them. If we don't pull the tops off them now, in about four days, you're gonna have you're gonna have seeds. And then you're going to have a lot more next year. So like I grew up on a farm. So this idea of there, there is a time when things have to happen. And, and I think a lot of, a, a lot of folks, okay, well maybe tomorrow. And like all of us procrastinate, I'm at the top of the list, but your point about we now, not only who are you waiting on, but we got to do it sooner than later. And sooner is almost always better. Right. So um, well, there are eight to- essential. Go ahead, Doug. And that gets to deciding wisely, which Chuck was getting into. And that's the whole thing. We make all these decisions. And if we can learn to decide wisely, because we've got, we've got our life, we've got time, how are we going to use our time, decide wisely. And, you know, if people just embrace that essential, it all by itself uh, will change people's lives. I mean, decision making and Chuck, you were saying it, I'll, I'll let it throw it back to you. But how many decisions we make and we talk about this and use examples literally in the book it's designed as chuck said to be a workbook we actually want to call it a used book like used cars this will be a used book <laughs> a, a a dog-eared marked up uh, book so exactly um, just like you've done it thank you exactly so um we, we, we will not have time everybody to get to all eight of the essentials of, in the kind of depth that uh, would be warranted. And so you're going to want to make sure you get a copy of this book, but from the two wise guys, don't wait for someone else to fix it. Um, so Chuck, since you brought up decide wisely, sure. Um, again, we could talk about any one of the eight though for our entire time and beyond, but what would be one thing, the one salient idea perhaps about how we can be better at deciding wisely, what would be one tip that you would give us? Well, here, here's what you can know. Uh, we're hardwired to be emotional first, logical second. And our emotions tend to sacrifice accuracy for speed. They want us to respond very quickly and are usually not the best choice. So the worst time to make any important decision is when we're emotional. So what we introduce in the book is a model that, that we call the four R's. And actually, Doug, in, uh, developed this uh, years ago, and he and I were discussing it. I remember it vividly, the discussion we were having that we call the four R's. And the four R's are recognize, reflect, reframe, and respond. And so recognition is about self-awareness. Recognition is if I notice that I'm emotional, and I know that when I'm emotional, I don't make great choices. I mean, you think about a lot of the regrets that we have in our lives. Most of those regrets have come when we were emotional. We did something, we said something that we wish we could take back or we regret. And so it could I, be high energy, positive or negative. So it doesn't have to so be anger or frustration. It could be euphoria or excitement. That's how casinos work. They work on uh, on some of that too. I'm seriously about that. I always say, you know, there's a reason why the lights are still on in there, which means <laughs> that they win more than they lose. It's as simple as that. Uh, uh, <laughs> Yeah, so I have a I have a 97 year old mother in law who loves to go to the casino. So it just makes me giggle when you say that. Um, in fact, as we're here live, that's where she is right now. As it turns <laughs> out. Um, so 
I, I love the four R's. I especially love this idea mm. of a reframing because I think when we're able to stop and take that moment and reflect, then we can reframe, which is often what we need to do. And my other observation that I'll make, and we're going to move on, is that we're pretty good at coaching others about this. Like, don't make this decision when you're emotional. Like, think about something. You yeah, sleep on children, it. That's or to a family here. member or a friend. Yeah. Like, may, maybe you want to sleep on this. Maybe you want to wait a few days. Pump like, we're brakes. good at recognizing this in others. First of the four R's. We're not always as good at doing it in, for ourselves. Um, the first two of the essentials are both about ourself. And, and Doug, you mentioned the first one. You said to aim to be our ideal self, which I love that way of, talking about we often talk about unleashing our potential but that's another way of saying it i really love that but the other one that you talk about is knowing your real self and so doug i'm curious what advice do you have about how do we do this better well chuck was getting into it in the decide wisely it really is the the it begins with the first r it's recognition so one of the things we can actually do and we'll do it now chuck and i we we this is real time live right direct so here's what we're going to do right now we're going to freeze and now we're going to unfreeze and what i'm going to ask you are three questions kevin when i said freeze what were you thinking about emotionally how were you feeling and physically what were you doing well so i will answer those questions because that's what you want me to do so what i was thinking is i read that in the book i and i didn't know you were going to do it uh but i was thinking like how you will this be do play it. out in the podcast and then how was i feeling i'm like i'm just gonna go with it it's gonna be fine um and, and i i trust doug enough to know that it's gonna be fine and then what the third one is what are you doing well, what I was doing was looking at myself to make sure I didn't look stupid when I was frozen. <laughs> well, so, but see, that's self-awareness. So what Chuck was saying is in decision-making, deciding wisely, you got to know who you are really. So, and, and what we, and the way the brain works is practice makes permanent. So all of our listeners, all of our viewers, uh, whether it's live or later, Anybody who starts practicing that game today, today, if you start practicing today, it will all by itself change your life because it will become a habit to pay attention to yourself. Most people overestimate how aware they are of themselves. They are unaware of how often their minds wander. And Chuck has interviewed uh, lots of great, uh, people for, you know, Eric Larson and Chris Klinke and different people who had to decide wisely out of self-awareness. And, and it starts with that. And so it's the freeze game, freeze game first, know yourself, who am I really? What, and I really am what I'm thinking. I really am how I'm feeling. I really am what I'm doing. That's me really right now. Now, I'm aiming to be my ideal self. And if I recognize that my real self in the moment is less than ideal, I can now make a decision. Yep. And that's the concept. And that's what uh, Chuck was talking about. Now I get to make a decision and I can decide wisely. I can decide to think what I need to think. I can decide to do what I need to do regardless of how I feel, so that I can achieve my goals consistent with who I view myself to be ideally. And that's the full enchilada right there. That is the full enchilada. So um, one of the things you talk about in the book, one of the eight things is learning agility, but you don't call it that, at least not at first. The title of the essential is really fantastic. It's uh, let go of what you know. And I, I, I think as positional leaders, right, mm -hmm. leaders with a job title, um, that this is especially hard. I mean, I, it's hard for us as human beings, of course. But when, we're, when we have the mantle of leader on, oftentimes we were promoted because 
of what we know. And we were right. promoted because we were smart and we had experience and wisdom right. and all that stuff. And yet you're saying that we need to let go of what we know, Chuck. Well, it's not letting go mean? of everything. Like, we know. like I said, it's not, it is about learning agility, but I love that you frame it this way rather and then talk about learning agility rather than saying, we're going to talk about learning agility, right? It's, so it's about, what do you it's mean? knowing I, what to let go of. You know, one of the people we interviewed for the book is a guy named Jeff Stiefler. Jeff Stiefler used to be president of American Express. He's done many uh, amazing things in his life, but he has a saying that everybody wants to be in the groove, but nobody wants to be in the rut. And wisdom is knowing the difference. So every pattern of behavior is a pattern because at some point we got results with that. What happens is as we get older and our lives change, some of those patterns begin to hold us back. So we tell a story about a woman named Sharon that we that I worked with many years ago. Sharon was a very successful executive, had her own business, uh, did very well financially, and was miserable. And one of the patterns she was noticing was that she – took care of everybody else in her life and didn't take care of herself. So she was about a hundred pounds overweight. She didn't work out. She ate one meal a day at eight o'clock at night. She worked from about seven 30 to about seven 30 in the morning, at eight o'clock at night. She had a stay at home husband, two adult children that lived at home. She took care of her clients, her staff, her family, everybody. And we were having a conversation around this pattern that, where she sacrificed her own needs regularly. And I said, Sharon, where did you learn that? And without any hesitation, she said, you know, I was raised by a single mom. When when I was seven years old, my mom came down with cancer. And so from seven years old till 11, when I was 11 years old, my mom died. I took care of my mom. And that's what Sharon needed to do when she was a child. But it was counter to what most children learn and experience growing up. Our parents take care of us. In Sharon's case... She took care of her mom, and that was a pattern she continued well into her 50s. So now Sharon got to decide, do I want to continue that pattern that worked for me as a child, or do I want to begin establishing boundaries? But it took this recognition and understanding of where that pattern came from, and that's true for all of us. Yeah. And so we got to let go. We got to figure out what we, we don't want to let go of everything we know. No. Certain things we need to be no. willing to let go of. It's interesting because when I was reading the book, I was, I was in that chapter. And then um, every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, I write a newsletter called Your Remarkable Day. And I needed to write tomorrow's. And um, yesterday I was with a client, with a group of leaders. And, and I heard the familiar refrain that you both have heard a million times. Like, what do we do with the people who say, well, we've always done it this way? Oh, yeah. And 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 <laughs> something that I was reading as I was reading in the book it got me thinking. That's what I want to write about. So that's what I wrote about. The idea is we've got to help people to say it worked once. Is it still working? Like right. is it? I mean, yes, that's true. Like so often, what we want to do is want to push back when that person says we've always done it this way. What we need to do is explore it more. Right? Give them the chance to recognize that perhaps it's not quite as rosy and red hot as it once was. Um, well, if one I, other if thing. I get the results in my life and my business that I want, if I if I'm not, then it's the definition of insanity. And oh, right, and the only person's behavior we can control is our own. So what I have to ask myself is, what is it that I'm doing or not doing that's contributing to the results I'm seeing? You know, a lot yeah. of times we get brought into an organization where they want us to change other people. So if you fix these other people, they don't say it this way. You yeah. fix these other people, we'll be fine. Yeah. My and daddy was used to say, when you realize, point your finger at someone, there's three fingers pointing at you. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's what we have to help them realize is how are you contributing to what you're seeing? And that's what most of us don't see is like, how am I contributing to, you know, what I want to be different in my life? Uh, Doug, there's another piece in that section. Um, about learning agility um, that you, you guys outline as the comfort growth paradox, which fits mm -hmm. with what we're talking right now. Doug, do you want to talk about that just for a second? The, the yeah. comfort growth paradox. Well, if you ask somebody and our colleague uh, at think to perform Ray Kelly talks about this all the time. And, uh, and he also has developed his own version of uh, five le uh, levels of leadership. But this comfort growth paradox is 
if you ask the question, if you had a choice, Kevin, between being comfortable and uncomfortable, what would you choose? Well, most of the time I'd probably pick comfort. Yeah. And most people would choose that if you, you know, I, you know, I got a choice. Now, if I have a choice between being uh, comfortable or growing as an individual professionally and personally, which would I choose growth or comfort? Right. I would probably choose to grow. Right. Yeah. That's what people intellectually choose. Behaviorally, they frequently choose comfort. Yeah. And so everybody knows the right answer. The right answer is, well, of course I would choose growth. That's a decision that they make that they don't execute. 100%. 100%. <laughs> so, so, um, so, so that's the key. Right. So that's the comfort growth paradox. So if, if, you know, and people, if you want to grow, then it's, you must accept there will be discomfort. The personal growth comes fully equipped with discomfort. And that's why, as Chuck was talking about earlier, we focus on developing those differentiating competencies, which are emotional and moral. Uniquely human, by the way. Machines don't have emotions. Machines don't have a conscience. This is uniquely human. And this is really important. It's really important for our listeners, readers, uh, viewers, whoever gets the message, however they get it. It's very important. And it's very important that they recognize not that they, they personally should not wait for anybody else to fix it. This is a toolkit. The book is a toolkit that you can use to fix stuff. And we all, we, <laughs> all got, we ought to fix. Um, and, and oftentimes we're waiting for somebody else to fix it for us. So I, I, I have a couple of sort of bigger picture questions before we wrap up. Um, I'm curious what you think. I'll let either of you take this or maybe both of you take it, take it in a short form. Um, so we've all lived and worked through a pandemic and I, I guess lived and worked both. Right. Sure. Um, the question is, as it relates to these essentials that we've been talking about and that you've written about, did the pandemic help or did it hurt? Or is it like, like how did, how did that experience that we've all lived through made us maybe more aware of or better at any of these essentials? Let's just start there. Has it helped us in any way in relationship to these essentials? Well, I would say this, you said, has it helped or hurt? And I would say, yes. It has That's helped. That's why I reframed my question. <laughs> no, it has, that it has helped and it has hurt. How it has it helped, helped and it has hurt. You know, and that's the, the age old question. Is the glass half empty or half full? The truth is it's half empty and half full. And until you understand that, all the COVID did is it helped us see some of the things differently faster. And some of us responded less well. I was one of them. The COVID wasn't so good. Anybody who reads Aim to Be Your Ideal Self is going to hear an unflattering opening story about Doug Lennick, you know, and, uh, you know, living in alignment, being this ideal guy that I've always wanted to be is not a lifetime achievement award. <laughs> That's why yeah. we, we have to pay attention to ourselves. Uh, so I would I would just say that. I don't know, Chuck, if you would add. Chuck, what would you how would you let's just I'll just I'll give you a more specific question, Chuck. What's one way that you think, and I mean, we're sort of asking not for an individual, but sort of, you know, societally, globally. Sure. What's what's one thing that maybe as leaders we've gotten a little better at because of? How did the pandemic help us? It's a great question. I think what the pandemic did in a positive way for us is it interrupted, back to what we were saying earlier, all of our patterns of behavior. How we worked, where we worked, what we did, uh, how we did it. I mean... So all of a sudden, for about two years, we these things that we were marching along doing, driving to work, going to the office, this is what I do, I get my coffee. I mean, all of that, you know, how I spend time with my family, all of that was changed for most of us. I won't say for all of us, but I'd say for most of us, all of that was interrupted. So I'd say many people, not all people, had some awareness around, well, how do I figure this out? Do, how do I want my life to be? Those are questions that most people were asking themselves. 
and to cause the re-examination of our lives. And I think what many leaders are trying to do is go back to the way things were. And as I'm sure you're experiencing in your work, Kevin, it, it's, you know, it's like that horse has left the barn. Like we can't unknow what we the just cord is not going all the way back to where it started. Right. And so what's this new way of being like, we're not going back to the way things were. So what's this new way that we want to be? And that takes some conversation that takes some like leadership to say, guide those conversations to say, no, we still have to be productive. Yeah. You know, we still have to add value, but maybe we think about it in a different way. That takes some learning agility. That takes some, you know, some courage to have that conversation. And that's really where leadership is so important. If people were, were supposed to, were, you know, if the people were machines, they do what they were always supposed to do, but they're not. So leadership is important. You know, one of my favorite definitions of leadership comes from a guy named Joel Barker. And his definition is leadership is about taking people to a place they would not normally go on their own. And so it's about, okay, so, you know, we have a business, we have to add value to our clients. How do we want to, this is an opportunity to re-examine how we're doing that. That's the positive, I think, I think that came out of COVID. Awesome. Yeah, so before we wrap up, I've got a couple of questions that I ask pretty much all of our guests over time. And it's a bit of a shift from where we've been. So Doug, I'm going to have you go first, but I want both of you to answer both of these questions. And the first one is, so Doug, what do you do for fun? I What I do for fun is I play with my grandchildren. That's the most fun I have is uh, my being with my grandchildren. My I have two that are just two years old. They're 10 days apart, a boy and a girl. And uh, I just gave one of them last night uh, his, uh, his, his Timberwolves jersey. His name is Conroy, and I call him Big C. So he's B, th number three, Big C. So that's what I do for fun. My oldest grandchild is 15, and I'm driving his hand-me-down car right now. So he will get this car when he's 16. And that's the, the most fun I have, frankly. But I love working. I, I have to admit, I, I, I just have fun most of the time. But the, the most fun is my grandchildren right now. Chuck, what about you? I enjoy anything uh, outside. So I live in Colorado. If it's camping, if it's skiing, if it's just sitting around a campfire, I realized years ago that some of the best times of my life have been around a campfire, uh, usually with people that I care about, my family, my friends. So I'm, I try and be outside running. Doesn't matter. Anytime I'm outside, I'm usually enjoying myself, and it doesn't matter about what kind of weather I'm having or we're having. We're, we're both old Boy Scouts, operative word old. <laughs> so with the campfire deal is really – I'm an important part of our lives. A lot of good things happen around the campfire. Gotcha. So uh, when you're not around the campfire and you're not playing with the grandkids, uh, Chuck, what are you reading? What's something you're reading now or have read recently that you might share with us? Two books that really stand out for me. One um, is a book by Stephen Covey, M.R. Covey. He actually, we actually interviewed Stephen for our book and he endorsed our book. Uh, he wrote a book out here recently called Trust and Inspire. If you're familiar with Stephen M. R. Covey, I know many of us know his dad, but M. R. Covey wrote a book um, called *The Speed of Trust*, and where high trust exists, things move faster and are cheaper. And so, trust is really important in life and business, in particular. The second book I'm reading is *Atomic Habits* by James Clear. It's all about how to stop bad habits and start good ones, and it gets to what we were talking about earlier. If I want to change my behavior. How do I begin doing that? And that's where I think his book's so, so important and so significant. I, I don't need to be going to the gym an hour a day or running five miles a day if I've done nothing. But could I do a push-up? Could I take the stairs instead of the elevator? Well, probably we could. Could I drink more water? Probably I could. And so it's this incremental pro progress towards being the person I want to be. Perfect. Doug, what are you reading? Uh, I'm reading a book right now. We do one of the things we do here uh, at Think to Perform at our company is we have every other week we have this thing called dialoguing with Doug. Anybody can join in. And typically what, what we do is a book review. 
and the book we're we're using right now and it's phenomenal is called big feelings by uh one of the authors names is liz fosling and uh, and liz will actually be at we do an annual conference and the evolve conference for think to perform will be this fall october 3rd and 4th and she's one of our speakers but big feelings she's an illustrator a lot of people might be familiar with her and i'm just starting a book and we'll be doing a, uh, some work with another client of ours on the book, The Goal. So, uh, which uh, has, and we're big on this whole concept of goal. So we read things that help us deepen our understanding of things that we already are knowing. And that's part of the let go of what you know is knowing is the enemy of learning. And so part of why we say, let go of what you know is so that you don't get stuck thinking, I know this, because once you declare I know, then you shut yourself off. And both Chuck and I read and write and uh, try not to shut ourselves off, but it's hard. It's not, you know, it's not easy growing up. <laughs> Before we go, the last question, the question you've been wanting me to ask since the very beginning is where can we learn more? Uh, where can you, where do you want to point people related to the book or the other stuff that you're doing? Where do you want to point people in relationship to the book? You can get the, you can get the book on Amazon, Walmart, Barnes and Noble, our online bookstore, a whole variety of places. And the, and the plug I'll make for the book is you don't have to use all its eight essentials to see an impact in your life. It is, as Doug mentioned, an application-focused book. So there's exercises, tools, concepts that you can use and apply, and, and you don't have to use all of them. But you do have to use some of them. Well, you don't yeah. have to. But if no, you, you don't, don't do you're not gonna make, it's not going to make any difference, right? It's not a very good pillow, uh, as it turns <laughs> out. So uh, I'm also confident that you could you, people might want to go to think to perform, think, numeral to perform.com to learn more about these guys, their work, et cetera. The, the values exercise we talk about in the book, you can do on our website for free. There you go. Yeah. It's part of becoming your, my ideal self. Knowing my ideal self is knowing my values and you can do that on our website. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah, right. if anybody right. wants to do it, Kevin, they could literally in 10 minutes, they can do the, the values exercise mm -hmm. right now before the next half hour comes up. There you go. Think to perform.com. Uh, now, before I send you off and them off, I've got a question for all of you. It's the question I ask you every single week. What are you going to do? Now what? Now that you've gotten these ideas from these two wise leaders, see Doug? Uh, <laughs> now that you've had the chance to hear some things, maybe about the three R's, maybe it's something about the idea of using the freeze game to help you become more aware of yourself. Maybe it's thinking about the difference between a groove and a rut. What is it that you, and just a few of the things that I wrote down today, the challenge for you is to take action on what you learned, because if you just wanted to be entertained, you could have picked something better. Uh, but if you really wanted to want to get better, then it requires us to take action. So I hope that you will do that. Answer that question. What did you get today that will make a difference for you when you apply it. Because as we said earlier, practice makes permanent. So I want to thank both of you guys for being here. Thanks so much for having joined us. Thanks today. for having us, Kevin. To have you. Thank you. Thanks to you and remarkable podcast. We love it. Thank you. Yeah. So th uh, that's where I'll leave us. Um, if you are here for the first time, uh, go to wherever you find your podcasts and you'll find the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. If you can't find it, just go to remarkablepodcast.com where you can listen to and watch every episode, but also find a place to subscribe. So subscribe, like, like it, uh, refer it, tell someone else to join us next week when we'll be back for another episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>